to the House of Parliamentarian at the Maryland General Assembly for most of her career. And then her passion for local history and historic preservation led her down to St. Mary's, where she served as the historic preservation planner for the Department of Land Use and Growth Management until her retirement in 2019. Gracie's passion for history and collecting artifacts led her to create the Bayside History Museum in Chesapeake Beach, in North Beach, I'm sorry, 18 years ago. And she's worked on the Calvert 350th anniversary, the Southern Maryland War of 1812 bicentennial celebration, and for years has created exhibits here at the Calvert Library as well as for the museum. So what's her role at Camp Roosevelt? After Tom and Gracie Reimer decided to save the mess hall at Camp Roosevelt in 1984, Grace Mary Brady purchased the caretaker house and restored it. And through the years, she has collected Camp Roosevelt artifacts, memorabilia, and historic documents, not realizing she would start a museum years later. And now she's here with us today to share some of what she found. And let's give her a warm welcome. Troop 1, 
And we have a wonderful collector tonight who has filled three tables with Camp Roosevelt memorabilia, and he actually has on a very coveted Troop One shirt. It was on G Street in Northwest. <clears throat> Albert Chesley was the director of the boys' department. For a long time, this was the only troop, and according to Mr. Mathis, later in Scoutmaster, it grew to a membership of 150 boys. The organizational meeting was held at the Willard on June 21st, 1911. Mr. Livingston. I'm sorry, what? The Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'm going to take questions at the end, Susan. Uh, Mr. Livingston presided, and other office were selected. At that meeting, Mr. Martin was elected as scout commissioner, and imagine back at this time period, he got a salary of $1,000. He became the first executive secretary, a title that was later changed to scout executive. The council was incorporated May 12, 1922, under the laws of the District of Columbia. And then this is important to know because it has helped us identify years of some of the maps that we have. The name of the council was legally changed in 1936 from the District of Columbia Council of Boy Scouts of America to the National Capital Area Council of Boy Scouts of America. Camp Archibald Butt, 1913 to 1916. The first time the council met it was in 1912 on the Potomac River. In 1914, the first 60 acres were purchased. 1917 and 1918, there was no camp because of World War I. In the 1930s, 50 additional acres were purchased. In 1937, it was the dedication of the new dining hall and the recreational dining hall in Camp Roosevelt. And we're going to come back to this later, but very important to talk about the swimming pool at Camp Roosevelt that was built in 1959. And scout membership at that time was 42,953. Goshen, scouts participated in the World Jamboree held for the first time in the United States. You'll see later a picture of Vice President Hubert Humphrey for the non-scouting camping event that he had at Camp Roosevelt. 452 boys attained Eagle rank, 251 new units were organized, and 72,463 registered boys and 2,353 units. Think of the sheer volume of how many scouts went through Camp Roosevelt. And in 1970, Camp Roosevelt, the oldest Boy Scout camp in the country, was put up for sale. Who was Archibald Buck and why was the first Boy Scout camp named after him? He really was a mover and shaker in the Washington, D.C. area. He was a military aide, came from a long family of military. Uh, he worked with President Roosevelt. He worked with William Taft. And he died when the Titanic went down in 1912. So it kind of makes sense that in 1913 they named the first Boy Scout camp after all the heroic <coughs> efforts that Archibald Buck had done uh, during the sinking of the Titanic. He had parties, he was famous for being a mover and shaker in Washington, D.C., and for all the parties that he had in his home. Here is a picture of the first little mess hall at Camp Roosevelt called Camp Archibald Buck. And I just think it's so cute. And it's very small and shows you the size. It's a little bit bigger than the one in England. But um, the steps and the platforms is a common theme that you'll see throughout some of the other mess halls. This is an official Camp Archibald Buck book in 1914. 17 pages uh, with instructions told you how to get to to Camp Archibald Buck. It told you uh, to take the steamboat, Greenland, to Chesapeake Beach. If you were from Washington, you took the direct line <coughs> to 
to the railroad to Chesapeake Beach, and it really told you in no uncertain terms that visitors were only allowed once a week. So when the parents sent their young boys off to camp, they knew that they were only allowed to visit one time a week. Here is a registration form in 1915. The fact that some of these papers still exist, and when you get a chance to look at the collection over there uh, that Mr. Finch bought for you to enjoy tonight, these papers are more than 100 years old, and it gives us a really wonderful record of when the season for scouting was and the instructions, because you wouldn't get a lot of these instructions or questions today. Applicants were asked if they could swim or if they had any physical weaknesses. And they had to pledge their self to live up to the principles and the laws of the scouts. This is the boat. This is the yacht called the Camp Archibald boat. And they just taught so many boating type classes at Camp Roosevelt. They had major studies swimming life-saving, shows, hiking. As for the camp, uh, not only in Boy Scouts, but in our local North Beach and Chesapeake Beach, all the ads talk about we had clean water, fresh water, artesian well water. It seemed to have been very important back in that time period that you had clean water. World War I came. There was no camp in 1917 and 1918. But, in 1918, there was a scout farm in what's today known as Hennings Point. And look at all the work that the scouts did in cultivating 48 acres of land, getting donations from Henry Ford, growing 28 acres of corn, acres of turnips, lettuce, squash, beans, and then selling all the produce to passers-by and at the local hotels. In 1919, when the camp was opened after World War I, the name was changed to Camp Theodore Roosevelt, and then it was later again increased in size by the purchase of more land. I'm showing you this mess hall picture again because just think about what you're looking at, and now we're calling the same picture on a postcard. It is now changed its name to Camp Roosevelt, in 1920. And postcards are such wonderful snapshots of all of our history. In 1921, and it's here on the table for everyone to look at um, when we finish, is a wonderful picture of the mess hall that is signed. And what is particularly outstanding about this picture, not only is it signed, but it goes on to tell you who the people were that signed it and what they did. One person was a camp doctor. The other person furnished and operated his own boat for Tommy Oysters. He, his boat transported campers and staff to Chesapeake Beach. And he was from Gallows, Maryland. Carl was a camp cook and a soldier from Fort Myers, Virginia. James Hall was a camp quartermaster, and he went on to be an executive from southern New Jersey. The camp carpenter at age 15 who later retired from the U.S. Army as a lieutenant colonel. The kitchen helper, Henry, <clears throat> later became the president of the Fred Gishner Iron Works. We don't know what our little bugler boy later became, but at least as he's mentioned that his name is there. Here is a wonderful picture in 1925 of the same mess hall. Look at all the boys sitting on the steps, sitting on the landing. That is also up here for you to see and enjoy when you finish. These are scouts in the field. Some of these pictures are very interesting because it was very important back in that time for the scouts to learn to be quiet. So you'll see two or three pictures throughout this lecture where they're like that, and they're not allowed to talk. <laughs> Here they are again. For those of you who have a lot of brothers or boys, you have to know how hard it would be to keep 
that many <coughs> young boys for it. They had to go past scoutmasters and prove <coughs> that their hands were clean before they could come into the mess hall to eat. I think that picture is very tough. <laughs> For purposes of tonight, we weren't able to run the 14-minute movie. But I want you to know that it's there, because this movie was uh, done by National Geographic in 1932. It's a black and white movie. We purchased it and enhanced it a long time ago. It's on our webpage under our YouTube movies. Nothing gives you a better idea of the life of a Boy Scout camp in this movie. Um, they're doing everything from learning how to start a fire, to cook, to bird watch, to do life rescue. And one of my favorite parts of this movie is watching them build a signal stand out of the wood that they found on the beach. And then when they get to the top, the look of triumph on all those boys' faces is just amazing because they accomplished what they wanted to do. So when you get a chance, please watch this. It's 14 minutes long, but it really is just an amazing snapshot of a day at a Boy Scout camp in 1932. And they also did a lot of horseback riding there. So there's pictures of that, and not too many of the camps offer the horseback riding. The slowest race. First, I have to mention this photographer, Clifton Adams. He was a very famous photographer in the 20s and 30s, and he worked for National Geographic. Thank goodness he did. And thank goodness for National Geographic. For some reason, they loved to come down to Camp Roosevelt. And a lot of the pictures we have are from the photography of Clifton Adams and the publications and stories that they did in National Geographic. Here the boys are holding their turtles and they're getting ready for a race. So that's why it's called the world's slowest race. I just took this quote right off of this picture because that's what they were saying as they marched along. Hay foot, straw foot, keep in step. Bird study, bridge building, and pathfinding. And I just think that's really nice representation of an idyllic day at the Boy Scout camp. So, could anyone out here start a fire without a match? You had to learn how to do this when you were at the Boy Scout camp. You took a knife and an axe to make the bow. You took your shoestring around a sharp stick. You swung the bow, and then you really hoped it would work. I don't have any statistics of how many worked and how many didn't, but if you try to do this yourself, it might give you some idea of what a difficult task this was. African American scouting. When this book was written, and I have a copy of it available for you to look at, they also included the history of the African American scouting and the National Capital Area Council area. So they call them old timers. And the next three slides are all in quotes. Uh, I didn't have any pictures to complement this, but everything is taken directly from the history that they wrote. One of my favorite things about this um, was they named the troop. It was troop number 520. I love the second paragraph where they actually gave people's names and what they did for a living a school teacher, a dentist, a minister. Uh, it's just amazing. And then in 1929, the first Negro Eagle Scout was Robert Betts. In the early 30s, the 6th Division was created by the council. And in 1935, Captain Young was appointed as the first Negro field executive to serve this area. The 6th Division was so large that in 1943, it was split into two districts, the Russell after Aaron Russell and the Douglas after Frederick Douglas. Negroes serving the Cubs, Scouts, Explorers, and Russell. Douglas had swelled and included such able scouters again 
we have this record of people's names who participated in these camps. And my favorite was Portia Rare, the dead mother's dead mother. I, I don't quite know what that means, but she really had to be quite a pistol to earn the title of that. Prior to 1940, camping was done almost entirely on a troop basis, and sometimes at the Negro YMCA camp with them. In 1944, a piece of land near Olney was purchased, with money raised largely in the Negro community and supplemented by a grant from the National Council. This was the first actual council camp for Negro boys. It was named Benjamin Banneker after the distinguished Negro inventor and aide to Pierre Lafont in planning the capital city. 1951, 100 acres approximately was purchased near Lexington, Maryland. $15,000 given by Eugene and Agnes Meyer Foundation and designated as the new camp for Negro Scouts right here in California. Camp Chesapeake was progressively developed by weekend Work parties of Negro Scouts and Scouters under the leadership of Francis Bravery, the district chairman, Lemuel Penn, the camping chairman for the Russell Douglas District. In carving Camp Chesapeake out of the wilderness, these guys all got together every weekend after working a whole week. They, they just had a devotion and it became absolutely virtuous that they continued to make this camp the best that it ever did. It was abandoned and sold following the integration of the scouting program in the National Capital Area Council in 1955. There's a lot more information on this again. It's in the book that's available on the table for when we finish today if you want to look at that. The CMO plan of the Mystic Oak. The little RR is my initials for Rough Rider. We are so lucky to have decades of Rough Riders which are available on these tables and our private collector who drove four and a half hours today to bring Camp Roosevelt items here for you all to enjoy also has a great collection of Rough Riders. It really gives you, every week it was the newspaper for the boys at the newsletter, for the boys at the camp, and it talks about all of their troops and everything that they did and what they earned and how many badges were earned and what they ate. Uh, but what's important is CMO because the plan of the Mystic Oak is exclusive to Camp Roosevelt. You had to, the CMO had three degrees that you could obtain. First degree members had to spend two weeks in camp, be a first class <coughs> scout. I'm unclear as to what the definition of a first class scout is, but I think you really had to be on the up and up. And, and you had to show yourself to be of such character and such willingness to cooperate in the camp routine that you were recommended and accepted by special selection committees chosen for membership in the camp. Any camper thus accepted was notified on Friday night of the second week of each period and they were eligible to apply for membership. The little picture of the beanie that was on the page before is a pledge beanie. We actually have real CMO beanies here tonight on that table. A second degree had to be a three-year camper with at least four weeks of service at Camp Roosevelt. They had to do a project of advanced service that had to be approved by three third-degree members of stations, adults. They had to be elected by a majority of the second-degree members present at the election. Third degree honorary and very elected. During a camp session, any CMO member could submit a list of names proposed for this honor to any of the Council of Adults. They would then select 10 names from all of the submissions at the second meeting following camp. From this list of 10, only five every year was selected to receive the coveted third degree. CMO was from 1921 to 1952 
If you had the red letters, you were considered first degree. And again, I would encourage you to look on the table when we're done because we have every single beanie over there. Thank you very much. The white CMO letters were the second degree, the blue were the third degree, the gold was for the adults. And again, I'm reminding you that this only existed at Camp Roosevelt. In November 21st, 1951, the Order of the Arrow was approved as a service, service organization for camping at Camp Roosevelt, but the Order of the Arrow had been established before them. They had not adopted it to be used at Camp Roosevelt because they were using the CMO. 1929 to 1939, just some really fun tidbits of camping during that time period. More acreage was purchased. They assumed, this area assumed jurisdiction over Culpeper, <coughs> Charles Calvert, and St. Mary's counties. They had a conference at the White House. The Sea Scout boat, the Argo, was bought from Annapolis to Washington and fully equipped. An Eagle Scout named Paul Sippel went to the South Pole with Admiral Burger and continued to work as a scout. Colonel Wilson became the first Sea Scout commander, and in 1929, they participated in inauguration ceremonies for President Hoover. Again, in the Rough Riders and in the histories, every inauguration for more than 40 years was featured with scouts. In 1930, the 10-year program of scout advancement launched. Uh, here again, they're participating in the inauguration of Franklin D. Roosevelt. 1931, the visit of the SS Constitution to Washington, <coughs> and the Sea Scouts assisted at the President's Regatta. 1935, the National Jamboree. All of these books and all of this information are on these tables here, and it's really fun to read what they did. <coughs> the Corbin Strong Dining and Recreation Hall was dedicated uh, in 1937. In 1938, four counties south of the Rappahannock began their affiliation with the National Capital Area Council. And the biggest thing that they wrote about for almost a year was the visit of the British King and Queen when more than 4,000 scouts greeted them on the White House grounds. Rough Riders, again, 802 different campers spent a total of 1,956 weeks in camp. The average stay was 2.2 weeks. 97 different troops from the District of Columbia Council the CMO recorded new records with 184 boys taking the first degree, 37 elevations to the second degree, nine first and then five second degree. 91 scouts qualifying for the American Red Cross Junior Life Saving, nine for the senior, and nine for the scout lifeguard. Harry Cutler wrote in the Rough Rider that he counted 39,000 708 meals were packed away in the mess hall. And that the nets went up early on the water so they'd be free of sea nettles at the time, and they built new diving boards and appliances. The Catholic services. The Catholic Church was very instrumental in the beginning of Boy Scouts. The Archdiocese of Washington worked closely hand in hand with the National Capital Area Council. And Reverend Fuller was appointed our chaplain for the Catholic Scouts. He served 25 years. I'm reminding everybody that initially, scouting was only for the Catholics, and they only had a Catholic service there. We have a very unusual map, which again is up here on the table for you to look at. And what was so unusual about this map, and I circled it in red, it's the only one of the historic maps that I have in the collection of Camp Roosevelt that refers to the Protestant Chapel as well as St. George's Chapel. So on this one map in 1937, they're showing two different church services. 
It doesn't show up later on any of the other maps or records that we have. This is a picture of the National Jamboree in 1937. Here is the dedication of the new Corn Strong Diamond Hall, which you'll see later because this is the Diamond Hall that my parents later restored. This is the inside of the mess hall. What's fun about the floor space and the inside of this mess hall is everything is hardwood floors and if it's empty you're walking along and there's little squares cut in the floors. So they simply lifted out the little square and after the scouts were finished eating, they swept all the food and everything through the little squares onto the ground below. So Camp Roosevelt had some of the best fed critters. <laughs> The first scout radio, again, we learned all of this information from the valuable history of our Rough Riders, was June 29, 1938. Uh, Camp Roosevelt had a radio station. It sent its first little message of the camping season on June 29th. Hobie Williams and Murray Hall were the operators. They contacted an amateur radio operator in Waynesville, Ohio, who relayed the first messages to Washington. You have to put yourself in that time period mm -hmm. to realize how significant what they accomplished that summer was. Farmer's Market in 1938. Today we think farmer's markets are our ideas. Kim Roosevelt has been doing farmer's markets for more than 60 years. Uh, the community joined them for the farmer's market. All the neighbors have spent their lives in this vicinity. They watch Camp Roosevelt grow and expand. They're supporters of scouting in general and friendly to Camp Roosevelt in particular. Let us then make a special effort on picnic day to express our welcome, for we are proud of our camp, its location, and the people among whom we spend our camp season. Another farmer's market, but I have to put this one in. Bill and G was very famous in North Beach, Chesapeake Beach, and Camp Roosevelt. Um, he entertained kids for decades at the amusement park. And I was so happy to find this in one of the Rough Riders because Bill and G was going to show off his new trick rifle shooting and his 25-foot Australian Bull Whip exhibition. Billy G played Davy Crockett. Um, he played uh, a Native American Indian. He was any character that you wanted him to be. I see Pat smiling because Pat knew and just knew how wonderful he was to all of us growing up in Chesapeake Beach. We had some wonderful characters at that time who really entertained us for years and years. Here's a picture of the Camp Roosevelt staff in 1941. And I think it's really interesting because look how much staff you needed for one summer. That's a lot of staff. Oh, the next that I'm going to talk about is a tragedy. So I wanted to show you what a typical canoe looked like at that time so you can really understand what happened. The canoes were pretty shallow that they had during then. And in 1942, uh, scouts were at Camp Roosevelt for deep freeze. Three of the little boys, um, as boys will do, one of them wanted to get in his canoe and go out to the duck line that was right off the pier at Camp Roosevelt. We had a lot of duck lines that were up and down the Chesapeake Bay at that time. He went to go out in his canoe by himself to the duck line and he dropped his paddle. He starts yelling for help and his two friends go out to try to rescue him. These three boys ended up being swept away by rough water freezing temperatures, they ended up climbing into one canoe together, and they froze to death in 1942 on January 3rd. Um, Captain Harrison, who was a skipper of the fishing boat, 
um, found them. The naval planes were looking, the Coast Guard was looking, everyone was looking for these boys, and they had just drifted that quickly to Tillman's Island, and they were found there. <coughs> the Order of the Arrow Handbook, you heard me talk earlier about where we started the Order of the Arrow at Camp Roosevelt. It was actually held at many other camps a lot earlier. So we have this in our collection, so it was a nice opportunity to show you a real handbook from 1948. Again, here's more Order of the Arrow Sashes, and it was a wonderful service organization for campers at Camp Roosevelt. And there's another one of the Order of the Arrow books. Hurricane Connor came up the Chesapeake Bay in 1955. The naval base had their hands full those days. First of all, there was the sinking of the 11 Jane Marble right off of Holland Point, which most of you would recognize that today as Harrington Harbor South, that area. Bodies were washing ashore from Fairhaven to the beaches and the cliff. There was a fire department at the Navy base at that time. In fact, the little Quonset Hut is still there where the fire department was. All hands on deck as citizens in North Beach, Chesapeake Beach, the North Beach Volunteer Fire Department, the fire department from Randall Cliff, everyone went to try to save the people who were trying to swim to shore. Human chains were formed so that they wouldn't be killed on the rocks. And there were a total of 27 passengers that night on board. 14 people died, and 13 survived. And really, the only reason those 13 survived were due to the community involvement and the heroes that emerged that night to help get people out of the rough waters and seas. Uh, again, I'll refer to a duck line. We had a duck line in front of my house when I lived in North Beach Park. And they used my mother's boat and my neighbor's engine, and they went out and got four of the survivors off of that duck line that night. Navy base also trying to rescue the scouts. All the scouts and the staff were stuck at Camp Roosevelt. They couldn't get home too late, parents were worried. So the Navy base played another role and went down and pulled all of the scouts out of Camp Roosevelt and all of the staff and help took them to the naval base and kept them there and everyone was in a nice safe bunker until the storm had passed and then they were, they were returned to Camp Roosevelt. So that was one week that uh, people in both the communities of North Beach, Chesapeake Beach, Fairhaven, the naval base and elsewhere, they'll never forget that week because of everything that happened. This is drawing number 1958 of the camp. I have it enlarged up here for you to look at. I just put it in here. You really can't see much on this slide. But it lets you know that I made references to the maps and how they talked about where things were. Again, the, the two church sites now have disappeared in this map. They're not in this map at all. Ball fields and everything that were proposed in 1958 are also up here for you to look at. It shows the thought that they gave to really expanding the camp from the waterfront because you have to know the location of Camp Roosevelt and everything was peer related and waterfront related. These ball fields were out on Bayside Road. So they wanted to use all of the property that they had acquired and start having all of that out there for the use of the this was a yearbook in 1966, and again, thank goodness for the information that all of these pieces of papers provide for us. 2,800 campers that year, 162 leaders. The trading post sold 39,320 drinks, 24,500 feet of gift. The badges, 128 were earned in camping, 13 in hiking, 100 in cooking, and 155 in pioneering. The nature badges, 
soil, water, forestry, bird study, astronomy, Indian lore, zoology, and two in weather. 150 bales of hay were used that year along with 165 gallons of pine oil. And this I have to bold and underscore. The Health Lodge provided first aid to 85 of the boys, but 25 trips were made to Dr. Damaluji's office. And for anyone that grew up here, Dr. Damaluji was such a loved doctor. And until I read this, I didn't even know that he had been working at the camp also. The rifle range awarded 30 merit badges and 120,000 shots were fired. They had a rifle range there and they used real ammo at that time. And the Remington Gun Company had actually manufactured uh, scout guns for scouts that were specialized just for the Boy Scout for all of the matches that they had to earn. The book continues, aquatic badges, 348 boys receiving their swimming merit badge, 128 rowing, 191 canoeing, and 83 saving lives. Archery, this kitchen, the number of plates, bowls, cups, and knives large was 436,800. They didn't have dishwashers then. Each plate was used 504 times. Each cup was used 1,008 times. And all of this happened in one summer of the year. I put this in. This is a later picture, but we were just talking about all of the cooking, the plates, the washing, and the meals. This little shed that was behind the mess hall when my parents uh, purchased it was used by the kitchen help. They were there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Imagine the long hours that they put in and the long days. They would sneak out here. There were two bunk beds in the shed. They stuck out there to sleep and rest before the next batch of boys came in. Here's Vice President Hubert Humphrey featured in Life Magazine for a camping event, the non-camping event that I alluded to earlier at Camp Roosevelt in 1967. He had 2,442 boys there. The end of Camp Roosevelt, uh, by 1962, purchase of approximately 4,000 acres for Goshen in Virginia. At that time when they did that, the membership was 50,000. It talks about 1967, the scouts participating in the Jamble Ready. We just talked about the non-scouting and camping event that was done with Vice President Hubert Humphrey. And then in 1970, Camp Roosevelt, the oldest permanent Boy Scout camp in the country, was offered for sale by the National Capital Area Council. I have a three inch binder up here that uh, I know we have some former commissioners in this office and other people in the audience. A um, couple commissioners in here, as a matter of fact. The purchase of Camp Roosevelt by Calvin County commissioners was not without its drama. There were over a thousand signatures on a petition of people that wanted to purchase Camp Roosevelt. I have that all here in this book where you can read, thanks to Pete Grover, who's a former commissioner and kept all these records, he has three inches of what a commissioner and the detail that they had to look at and study to think about buying and going to get camp. So the county, um, they had an opportunity. Uh, there was 2,400 feet of Sandy Beach. And all of this was written in the petition that people signed so that they would clearly know exactly what they were signing. So in that book up there are your original signatures of more than 1,000 people who wanted to buy a kid school. School board supported us, <coughs> Economic Development Commission, supported the purchase. And then in 1977, this went on for years, back and forth, back and forth. 
1977, the Willows community came out in very strong opposition against the purchase of Camp Rosenheim. So on this side, you had over 1,000 people who had signed petitions who wanted to buy Camp Rosenheim. The Willows community was the small community next to Camp Rosenheim who felt that they would be negatively impacted by a open beach and community here and would have fought for everyone. Long story short, day one, the county did not buy Camp Rosenheim. In 1977, um, my father, Tom Reimer, Gracie Reimer, his parents, Furman, Amy, Houston Kidd, Ken and Therese Johnson, James Hollinger, and Robert Thomas all formed a partnership and purchased Camp Rosenheim. It sat for a very long time. Nobody did anything with it for a long, long time. Uh, it was really a partnership until they could figure out what they all wanted to do. Ironically enough, um, all of the members of this original partnership have passed on. And when I talked to Mr. Johnson yesterday, he said, Grace Barry, I'm the last man standing. So Ken Johnson and him, his wife, Therese, still live at Camp Roosevelt, and yes, he's the last man. This is a postcard. I wanted to include some of the history of the pier because it has changed over the years. This is the pier at Camp Roosevelt. Here's another pictures of the pier throughout the decades. If you're at the end of the pier in that first picture to your left, and you're looking towards the trees, um, they had switched from the wooden boats to the metal boats at that time. But this is what the pier looked like. Metal boats again, replacing the wooden ones, and the boys used to camp directly right on the beach. This pier with lower deck and all the sea metal poles, um, we no longer have a, a lot of these pieces. Uh, we don't have the sea metal poles. But this is a particularly good picture because it shows the evolution of the pier over the years. Trees would come along during the wintertime, great storms would you know, wipe out sections of the pier. Pier repairs constantly. My youngest brother, Willie, has always been in charge of keeping the pier fixed. And uh, you'll have to ask him one time what he thinks about all of that. Because he'll just get it fixed and then something will take out another section or more boards. Boards knocked out and then the pier's getting fixed again. But the pier was such an important part of the Boy Scout life and community life. Saltwater pool. I said earlier that I wanted to talk about this. This was one of three pools in that area. The first one being at Rose Haven, which is Harrington Harbor today. The second one being part of the Chesapeake Beach Amusement Park. And the third one being at Camp Roosevelt. All of these pools used water from the bed. They were salt water pools. Um, the only pool left is the one right now at Harrington Harbor. And it's still the original pool. It doesn't use water from the bay any longer, but that's the original pool uh, founded by Joe Rose and Rose Hayden. Now we get to some really interesting thoughts about the missile at the end. Colin and Susan Shaw were very good friends with my parents. So in the summer, June of 1984, my mother started in 1983, we have to do something, we need to make a decision. Are we going to fix this mess hall up and live there, or are we just not going to do anything, we'll go sit down, what are we going to do? So they decided to do some investigation into the condition of the mess hall. So Colin took um, Grace Reimer and Gary Reimer, who was Tom Reimer's oldest son, who was a builder, they went up in a plane so they could get a bird's eye view of the damage of the mess hall rooms. This is what they saw from the air. All of this is what they saw. 
That's a bay in the background. So then they decided to better look at what everything else looks like on the ground. So the mess hall interior that you saw in the earlier picture from 1937, this is what it looked like in 1984. This is the total destruction of the mess hall. Trees had fallen in the middle part and just wiped out whole sections of the mess hall and the kitchen. And this is what um, my parents, Gary Reiner, my younger brother Willie, this is what everybody was looking at going home. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that like that yeah, it was. Again, I'm calling it decision time because I want you to see what they looked at when they were on the ground. <clears throat> The kitchen's on the left, the mess hall is on the right. This is an earlier picture before the total cameras. Again, the kitchen and the mess hall. More rooms. You can see it was a very bad condition. Mother nature, trees, weather, no one living there did a lot of damage. Rotted floors, beams everywhere. You were really very careful when you walked around the side during that period of time. The great mess hall without any boy scouts. Had two large stone fireplaces on either side. So you're looking at two different things. Weather meeting is being very common. It's just totally exposed, a lot of wood rock. <laughs> and then some areas have quite a smell to it. So they're talking, should we even try to save this? So I guess I have to look at you out in the audience and say, would you try to save this? You've seen it from the top, you've seen it from the side. So they decided to look at the foundations. Tom Weiner, uh, first degree, was a civil engineer from Cornell, and he loved to build. His older son, Gary Weiner, loved to build. My younger brother really loved to build. So we had builders in the family, which was a great thing. These are foundations of the kitchen and the mess hall. More foundation work on the floor. More foundation work in the mess hall, not being held up by much right there. So they deemed it was a solid foundation and decided to make a decision. So here's the first workbench, and everyone got to work to save the mess hall. Here's the reconstruction of the Camp Roosevelt mess hall. Again, you see the beautiful stone fireplaces. Gary Reimer, Tom's oldest son, many times I would pop in and he would just be like scratching his head or saying exactly what I quoted. What did I get myself into? My family has chided me for 50 years for uh, always taking pictures and driving me crazy. But I have to remind them that times like this, these pictures have come from many people. So that's being very interesting. This is Gary and his crew, the Shabira boys, my younger brother Billy, everyone working very hard to save the mess now. Framing for those builders out there, this is an amazing amount of framing. Close some of the things. So they can use it for long as they 
delivery of beans and wine edged palm. <coughs> the roof is restored. An addition was put to the original mess hall because my mother wanted a great sunroom where she could just envision herself sitting there with her feet propped up when they stopped working so hard and read. She loved to read. Half done, half to go. The wood is beautiful. That's a picture of my younger brother, Willie. This is a new front door. If you were to go to the mess hall today, that front door did not used to be there. We came in from a dirt road to what is the back of the mess hall today. So the whole new front door and the driveway was new at the end by Tom and Tracy Martin. Isn't it looking better? Yes. Restored by 1985. I'm going to take you back to the kitchen because this is really important. <clears throat> this is how or bad condition the kitchen was in. And if you think of all those meals that were served, uh, it's just amazing that this kitchen still exists and never burnt down because if you think of all the cooking and all the wood. Uh, Tom Reimer decided to put a swimming pool inside the house and inside the old kitchen. So the picture on the right shows the start and the framing of the swimming pool. Here they're digging out the floor of the old kitchen to put the swimming pool in. Here's the frame and the liner of the swimming pool. Because keep in mind, um, I mentioned earlier, he uh, had a degree in civil engineering. And he was going to use this water in the swimming pool to heat and air condition in the mess hall and use geo So that was the whole purpose of the swimming pool. And there's a finished swimming pool. And that's a black and white of the swimming pool, which used to be that whole kitchen. Here's a black and white with the restored mess hall inside. I draw attention to the chain that's going up to uh, Tom's law office that he had in the house because we also have a law office down here in Prince Frederick. And the chain work, um, one of my brothers, Robert, shipped out, he graduated from Tiny Point, and he shipped out on LNG ships and was a welder. So he did all of this rock iron work on these stairs the chain. Inside of the mess hall again, it was filled. Uh, I'm the oldest of seven. We have three stepbrothers, a half-sister, more than 30 nieces and nephews. Every holiday was 40 to 50 people with their friends or spouses, and tables after tables were set, and a lot of very happy times at the old mess hall by my family. Christmas trees is a whole different story. My mother loved Christmas, and she sent my youngest brother, Billy, every year up to Virginia Kidwell's tree farm on 260 to get a Christmas tree. Bear in mind, these trees were 25 feet tall and larger. Willie had to cut them down, get them back to the mess hall, and then get them inside the mess hall because she just had to have a tree that touched the roof. So here's a picture of one of those trees inside the mess hall. They really did love Christmas. My, my mom went all out every year Christmas time. So here's the inside of the mess hall, all decorated for Christmas. Here's more rock iron work done by my brother Robert Gare, that huge rock iron bed that my parents slept in. He made that bed from scratch. Living room, kitchen. Kitchen was very warm, lots of cabinets, uh, a center aisle. 
Uh, it has been remodeled uh, since my parents did, and it's more open now, so it's so interesting to go back there and see the changes that have been made since they put everything in that they have done. So can I interject? The kitchen was made by Amish people from Pennsylvania, and it was the first time I ever saw cabinets with glass on both sides, so you could see the spray through the cabinet. Okay, so this is my welcome to Camp Roosevelt. And Susan, I'm not sure if they picked that up or not. So. And at the end of my talk, I want to acknowledge the Bayside History Museum, all the staff and volunteers, the town of North Beach, our mayors and our town council members. We would not have some of the wonderful early photos that we have tonight had a hot with Paul Brendel and Gary Colangelo. Uh, Kyle is the National Order of the Era Digital Archivist for Scouting. He's an expert on CMO, which was featured at Camp Roosevelt. And he is an avid scout, memorabilia collector, like our friend Mr. Finch over here, who knows Kyle. Uh, the last things that I have here were gentlemen um, who came up prior to COVID. We had a Camp Roosevelt Scout Master of Scout Union every year. The guys came from all over the country, uh, California, um, Maine, West Virginia, Florida. Scouting was so important to them and so significant and it was such a big part of their life that they really look forward to uh, these roast, to these uh, reunions every year run by Gary. All of the stuff that they had, they donated to the Bayside History Museum. So all of their collections are inside the museum, and you can see them at any time if you can stop them. The history of scouting, again, I want to acknowledge and thank, had the National Capital Area Council not taken the time to write this history and put important people's names in it, we wouldn't have it to this day all these years later. I want to thank Mr. White at the National Scout Museum in New Mexico. And I want to again thank the what this is the last in our winter series talk, brought to you by the museum, Bayside History Museum, the library, and the John Hanson Doors of the American Revolution. So here's information on the Bayside History Museum. We always welcome scouts coming. Just call and make an appointment. Many times the, the leaders bring their troops there so they can get all kinds of different awards and earn their badges. And we have a lot more cases and badges and we're revealing them. And I want to leave you enough time tonight to enjoy some of the collection of the Bayside History Museum. But most importantly, the collection of all here tonight by Mr. Finch, who drove four and a half hours to bring you all of these cameras and all so at this time, um, I'll take a few questions. I don't know what time it is. 7.30. 7.30, okay. I have stayed within my hour. Um, <laughs> let me take a few questions, but really I want to give you time to go look at everything because I've covered a lot of material. Yes. What is Jim? While you were talking about the Boy Scouts getting Jim, I tried to Google. Oh, Jim, it's right. It's the classic, classic stuff that they make uh, yeah. That's a lot of it that they bought. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I, I saw my hand in the back right here. Okay. What was the last year that the uh, camp was operating? I know they had Boy Scouts there in 1967, and I know that Vice President had a group there in 1960, I'm sorry, Boy Scouts were there in 1966. I know that the Vice President had a group of non-campers there in 1967. Um, I have a camping expert here, and then I always use Mr. Conalingo for questions like that. I don't other than Goshen used it a couple times and then it came out. In 1966, the camp was closed okay. for some camp. Yeah. No longer, but because the camp hadn't been sold yet, you scouts that like the Lord Arrow, they did their uh, 
ordeals down there. I didn't learn anything down there in 1970. All right, so let me repeat that a little bit because it's being recorded. Um, I was correct in that 1966 was the last official year. Uh, 1967 was a year that the vice president was here with his group of non-campers. And because it was still not being used and had not been sold yet, uh, it was being used by small groups to come and get Ford or Arrow awards. Ford years, correct? Okay. Anyone else? Ralph? Well, first, I want to thank you for an excellent presentation, very interesting and informative. We didn't get a chance to yeah. I also wanted to make a comment. Stand up, stand up right there, too. Oh. You're, you're being YouTube tonight, so they trained me. Don't move. I also wanted to make a comment about Paul Seiple. You had mentioned Paul. You referred to him as Sipple. I've always heard it as Paul Seiple. I don't know if you know about that story, but it's really worth everyone here understanding it. This was a national competition of Boy Scouts. Every troop had an opportunity to nominate a boy to go to Antarctica. I mean, imagine what that thrill would be. Many troops did not do that, but of the troops that did, they could recommend one boy. And out of all of the troops that did, there was one boy who was selected, and that was Paul Seiple. And what that meant is that he got to go to Antarctica and live for a winter, not a summer, for a winter in Antarctica at Little America, which was the base that Admiral Byrd established. Some of you may be old enough to remember that he did a nightly radio show where he would talk to you via the radio. This was before TV. And he would tell you what the temperature was, what the wind was, all kinds of information. People just love that kind of stuff. Paul Seipel went down as a boy, and he came back as a man. And that's sort of words of Admiral Byrd himself. And from that experience, he went on to help to design the winter clothing for American soldiers during the Korean War. He spent his life studying Antarctica, including the wind chill factor that you guys wrote today. And most important, he eventually became head of the Antarctic program for the National Park Service and the National Academy of Sciences. A Boy Scout, given an opportunity, and made full use of that opportunity. Oh, thank you, Ralph. Thank you. So at this point, I'm going to say thank you and let him turn off all the electronics. So you can stop YouTubing and all of that. And every